clear as day, or more accurately, rainwater, that an opportunity for a home win for McLaren slipped through their fingers. But might that have been for the best? Because given the data that we saw, we could have had a situation where an intra-team spat might have occurred, or something that might have got tongues wagging in an even more controversial manner. Hear me out. Now let me preface this by saying that yes, I am a McLaren fan, and Oscar Piastri is my favourite driver at the moment. Although if Mick does find himself back in F1 with either Alpine or Williams, that loyalty might be tested. The British Grand Prix this year was a far less harmonious occasion than last year for McLaren, and I reckon that it could have been either much better or even worse had McLaren simply done the double stack. But at the same time, what this does show is that the car that McLaren has is a really quick one, especially when it's set up for changeable conditions. Kind of like what the MCL 60 was last year, even before the major upgrades in Monaco, it was really quick, even though it was only on for a few points rather than a win. But despite that, their mindset in terms of strategy is still stuck in the realms of the midfield. What do I mean by that? My friend, a short view back to the past. Ever since 2021, whenever the opportunity for a big result came around, the team would hunker down and not take any risks. Lando had experience of that firsthand with the 1-2 at Monza when he was told to hold position behind Daniel instead of going for his first win. Now, either that was down to simply not rocking the boat and potentially risking a situation which we saw at Turn 1 with Verstappen and Hamilton in dramatic fashion, or put simply, it was there to help boost the morale of Daniel Ricciardo, their big name signing, who they thought could lead the team into their next era and then prove that that wasn't the case and then Lando was ultimately invincible. If Norris and Ricciardo had started bickering for the lead about who was going to get it and they both crashed or compromised their race, then Bottas would have sailed right past them and then wouldn't that have been unfortunate. Whilst the team has certainly improved when it comes to their driver lineup, their car, their facilities and their coffers, what they still lack is that boldness in strategy and being proactive more often than not. Now they do have their moments of course, they are improving, because the Austrian Grand Prix, the fact that they kept back a set of medium tyres for the final stint of the race, that was an absolute masterstroke, it paid dividends for them. They had the same option here, keep back the medium tyre, which ultimately proved to be the fastest, which Oscar over the radio did not question at all. And it does remind me of what happened in F3. In practice, Luke Browning did not set a lap at all, choosing to keep back a set of wet tyres in case the race remained wet, which it did for a while, but ultimately it didn't work out. He still got pole though, even though he hadn't done any practice laps, so uh, that, that's ballsy from Luke. In hindsight though, McLaren does recognise their errors, but hindsight does not get you results unless you learn from said errors. And you know, Zach, maybe focus more on your team instead of trying to bash Red Bull over the head with a really expanded version of the F1 rulebook. Now, of course, I don't want to take away from Lewis Hamilton's win. That did happen, and it happened magnificently. He was able to read the conditions of the track with all of its experience, and he was able to run rings around the McLarens, run rings around his teammate, and have just about enough juice in his tyres to keep Max Verstappen behind. It was close, though. A couple more laps, and then Max might have had him. And props to Mercedes as well for performing the undercut against McLaren and Norris. I, I need not remind you the whole cooldown room. Lewis expecting McLaren to do one thing and then they didn't do it. And he's just like, what are you doing, mate? What? But you can't deny that right now, McLaren are a top tier team. They are a front runner because, of course, you're getting Red Bull taking pot shots at them, of course, and McLaren clapping back. And then the sweetener of it all, other teams copying your car instead of Red Bull's directly. Although you could argue that McLaren were copying Red Bull initially, so it's a bit of a copy of a copy. But either way, it was enough to get Hulkenberg P6, and I will be talking about him in a future video, so if you want to find out when that drops, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Because seriously, nobody's talking about Hulkenberg, how good he is. Mercedes, seriously, cost out a potential buyout from his Audi contract. When you look at Red Bull and Mercedes, their nearest competitors, I would say Ferrari too, but come on. They're going through a bit of a mini crisis right now, them having to revert to the Imola spec of car, and then losing months of development in the process, and they're losing their technical director to Astral Martin. Yeah, the, that, that things aren't looking great for Ferrari. They really need to get that Adrian Newey deal done and dusted. And this ESPN article talked to both Mercedes and Red Bull about what the key ingredient was when it comes to giving them the optimal conditions and results for this race. Driver engineer feedback. Christian Horner's quote especially really gave me some clarity as to what McLaren is lacking right now. So pay attention to this one. Ahem. You've got to have a relationship, the driver-engineer relationship, of course, what are you thinking? Working with the strategists, the spotters, everything has to come together. 
and Max was giving us great information. And we picked the right tyre at the end of the race, and we got the calls at the right time, and he delivered on it. Everything has to be working in harmony. McLaren doesn't have that at the moment. And when it comes to the heat of the battle, they especially don't have it. Them really starting to question their own strategies. They knew the medium tyre was best toward the end of the race if it was damp and then getting drier, and yet they didn't stick to it. Instead, they deferred to their usual protocol. They listened to Lando, and Lando was saying, we should go to softs, any slick is better than the Inters. And then they said, well, will we have softs, do you want to cover Hamilton or Verstappen? And then they were thinking Hamilton. They were just thinking of what was ahead instead of what was behind. And then Verstappen and just sailed right past him on the hard tyres. When it comes to important decisions, the team usually allows the driver to question team decisions. They look at the info for what the driver presents and then the call that they make is final, be it in the driver's favour or not. But I understand that making mistakes like this is the only way that McLaren will learn and ultimately improve and become a top tier team again because they haven't been for a very long time. And they've also got to balance the idea of taking their driver seriously because if they constantly went against their driver's decisions, and then the drivers were upset, then they're not going to be happy racing for your team and they will look elsewhere. It's a really fine balancing act. I get that from McLaren. It was really tricky. And throughout all of this, Oscar was defending the team, saying that, oh yeah, the double stack was a really tough decision to call. It's one of the toughest decisions ever. So even when he lost the chance for getting this win and ended up fourth again, Oscar was still diplomatic. Despite that though, McLaren really need to be a bit more ruthless with the sheer amount of objective data they have to hand. And races like these will produce a stronger team in the long run at the cost of some short-term pain and derision, with articles left, right and centre calling the team out for mistakes or losing out on races. And I am one of those critics because I suffered throughout the entire McLaren Dark Age of 2014 through 2022 or 3, depends on when you think the Dark Age ended. I personally think it ended this year, but it was still a very long time and I'm glad they're back on form, but there's still some growing pains to be had. I'm happy that the team is in this position where they can think about victories and podiums very realistically and quite convincingly in some places, but at the same time, I'm really not sure that I'm proud of the team's direction at the moment because right at the moment, they're in a mudslinging match with Christian Horner and Zach Brown being the main instigators and it's just getting really ugly. It's being decided over rules and policing. You get Lando and Oscar going, that was naughty, that should get a penalty. They're calling out things on the fly and I don't really like that. I don't like nitpicking. I'd rather them beat other teams on the road. But the opportunities they do get are being squandered out of either a lack of proactive decision making leaning too heavily on the drivers in critical moments so as not to undermine the team, or, as Andrea Stella put it, they got too greedy in not wanting to lose any time whatsoever, be it through the conditions or losing time in a double stack. Or alternatively, to maybe see if they could get the double stack to work with a little bit of time, they could have asked Oscar to back off by a couple of seconds, allow a bit of a gap to get Lando out, Oscar in. Sure, they would have lost time on the road and in the pits, but it was certainly a lot better than losing nigh on 15, 20 seconds because simply they waited too long to pit Oscar. Or maybe be even more proactive and try and undercut with Lando the lap before Oscar so that means he could pit when Verstappen did. Also, I wouldn't necessarily call it greed, Andrea. I would call it more paranoia for fumbling the double stack and not wanting to resort to it. And not to mention, they probably not trained in how to do a double stack in a very long time, so they probably weren't proficient in it. And then Zach Brown was saying that, oh, well, we tried that in Jeddah in 2023, it didn't work out. And then the following year at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, the double stack opportunity was there, they didn't take it, it cost Lando dearly. He ended up in eighth. You see, this is the overarching theme in the moment. They still feel like that they should be clinging on to whatever result they have, be it a podium or otherwise, with both hands, risk aversion, caution, leaning too heavily on the drivers to be all diplomatic and fair, and instead of just going back to their pit wall, the teams of information that they have, that the drivers don't have, and then just say, look, we have the data, we know what's going on with your car, all of those sensors, we think that you are probably a bit safer here, why don't you do this? And then the drivers just go, no. And then McLaren's like, Okay. And also sometimes McLaren just needs to read the room or the sky or the track. This was a very, very unpredictable circuit with rain coming and going. The drivers were probably really concentrating in just keeping the car pointed forward. So maybe take some mental load off them, not make them have to think about strategy and just provide them all the objective information they need. And then just say, look, we're going to do this. The drivers can go, okay, like Oscar did with the tyres. So yes, the mediums were the right call, whereas Lando dithered. It made him a little nervous. He overshot his garage. That lost a couple of seconds. You get the idea. 
And thusly, I really feel the need to elaborate on my use of the firm of doubt in my previous video because, yeah, I have a lot of doubt right now. I touched upon it in that video and I wanted to expand upon my thoughts here with data provided by Code F1 and Formula Timer on Twitter. Give them a follow, by the way. Because I reckon McLaren was spared an even worse scenario from occurring because ultimately, sure, they lost out on a 1-2 and Lando getting a home win, but they still came away with a decent amount of points. They're right on Ferrari's tail and the constructors and they will learn from this. They will train up in double stacks. They might be more proactive in decision making. So they did learn a lot from this again at the cost of some short-term pain and people making fun of them and thinking that they're completely washed and they're an also ran team what might have been team as espn put it so this was actually the best outcome even though it might not look it and you might be thinking i'm being favorable toward oscar piastri but you just have to look at the data that code f1 and formula timer provided when you look at that data from Sunday, the Australian was either on the ball with Norris or perhaps quicker in the conditions. Code F1 made a handy chart in particular showing that in the wet section of the first tint before the pit stops, Lewis was handing it to George, whilst Oscar was doing the same with Lando. Illustrating that Piastri perhaps has a dab hand in these conditions. When the slick tyres are going away from the track, it's getting damper, and then you might have to make the call on going into inters. Although formula data analysis also argues the point that McLaren was set up for these conditions, it resulted in them being more draggy and dry conditions but maybe this was just the choice they needed to make because you were not going to get full-on dry lap times throughout the entire race or at least right at the start but only then and that's not all when you look at the overall race pace and the average lap times, whilst Hamilton was the fastest and Verstappen was able to thrash the hard tyres to be the third fastest on average, Piastri is faster than Lando by almost a tenth of a second on average. And when you put the final stint into the mix, Oscar is seven tenths a lap faster on average. Not only did Lando have to suffer the degradation of the soft tyre because the setup that McLaren had, it was just not going to work out, whereas it kind of worked with Mercedes, he also had to suffer the degradation of his teammate on the right tyre catching up hand over fist and the lap counter saving his bacon. What I'm getting at here is that Oscar was showing his potential in this kind of weather and is able to keep his cool with a tired decision over the radio proving quite a good example of his calmness. Piastri choosing to vent in private and behind closed doors instead of in the media pen and coming off as quite reserved and guarded. I can also understand why for some of you you might be thinking well he's kind of robotic he's really not all that fun he's not that exciting but sometimes that might be for the best. Maybe this is all of the training he's got from Mark Webber. Don't let the media in don't give them any ammunition to write article after article after article about you because Lando's doing the complete opposite. He's doing what he usually does. He's being overly critical. Again, to the point where even Jensen Button started to get a little bit nervous and thinking, I don't think this is the right way to handle any of this because sometimes he's being harder than he should do. And look, I understand that maybe this is the way that Lando needs to process events, get it off of his chest, and then maybe he can regroup and then learn from it. If that works for him, it works for him. Fair enough. But in this situation where Oscar is not doing that and he's actually coming across as much cooler and much calmer, especially when the conditions are this precarious, it's not a good look. And this is where the foam gets tested. Had the double stack worked optimally and both drivers continued to be in the mix for the lead or a podium, would that have resulted in a team order situation where Oscar might have had to yield? We kind of got a similar test in Qatar last year, where Lando seemingly was quicker than Oscar and he did ask the team to think about team orders to let him through to try after Verstappen. But the team then said, no, we don't believe that that's the case. Lando questioned it, but then McLaren made the decision that was final, and then ultimately we got the result that he had. For that example, it worked out in Oscar's favour, but this year it worked out in Lando's favour at the Australian Grand Prix, where Oscar had to yield, at his home race no less, for a podium position, and then Lando got third place, but Oscar, he was magnanimous, and he decided that, yeah, that was probably the fair call. I'm pretty sure that Oscar was gutted to not be on the podium, but hey, he trusted the team. Maybe he's a little bit too trusting. Maybe he sometimes has to just really take initiative and just go with his gut. I'm pretty sure that Mark will be talking to him about that now because that's actually a consideration. Had things gone right, would team orders be activated? Because come on, let's think about it here. It's the British Grand Prix. Lando is in a prime position to win his first home race, especially since Russell retired with a water pressure problem. Lewis Hamilton had fallen right back behind Lando because in the conditions Lando was faster than Hamilton before everything came back toward the Mercedes and the drag penalty they had in terms of setup was minimized because you know the slick tires were not going to be performing optimally on this day. It was a 1-2 formation before the first stop. Oscar was teaming up behind Lando to within DRS range had it been enabled. He was quick. 
too quick, perhaps. I don't want to think that of McLaren, I really don't, but I'm just looking at the data. Oscar was quicker. On average, he was quicker throughout the entire race, and he made good use of the strategy that McLaren had provided him, whereas Lando simply didn't. He did it on the tyre choice, McLaren took it seriously, he overshot his garage, and then look where he ended up. He ended up third, and had the lap count been longer, he might have ended up fourth. So okay, maybe they might have allowed them to race, because we haven't been in this situation before, where both drivers have the fastest car, and they can be allowed to race for the win. If that had happened, what would have happened? As we saw in Austria, Lando has proven that when it comes to closing the gap to Verstappen for the title, he's not going to hold back, and losing points to Piastri would simply not do. Could we have seen the two fight for position, jockey for the lead, and maybe Lando do something drastic to make sure that he got past, and they might have collided? And had Oscar been able to keep him behind and actually get some distance, how would have Lando handled it? His confidence would have been an all-time low, because he would have lost the British Grand Prix to his teammate. Can you see what I'm getting at here? All of these quandaries, all of these hypotheticals, yes, it didn't happen. The reality is McLaren fumbled the strategy, Lando fumbled it, Oscar was completely shafted in terms of his potential to get on the podium for a second year in a row, but that was actually the best solution rather than having to deal with all those major headaches. Okay, I'm just gonna put the foam away now because I think I've made my point. Because in the end, I think it was just a genuine mistake. They just were not thinking like a front running team and they just lost time. They were thinking about the bigger picture and not wanting to muck up Piastri's race by waiting behind Norris in the box for something that they might not have been trained up on. They didn't have the confidence, but he was penalized anyway by losing upwards of 15 seconds, having to make up 30 seconds ultimately from going behind Carlos to within a few seconds of Norris at the end of the race. And I reckon that the Piastri camp is starting to get a little bit itchy at the moment because because at this point, both McLaren drivers could have had the opportunity to win more than just one race. In the case of Oscar, I believe, given what had happened with Norris and all of the other circumstances, he might have been on four Grand Prix victories by now, or at least have the opportunity to be even closer. And Oscar is doing his best to remain calm in front of the cameras, him using the word disappointed more often than is comfortable. And then during Ted's notebook, he came up to Mark Webber, Oscar's manager, and yes, of course, he was talking to other people. Mark probably didn't want to be rude, but Mark is media trained. He was a pundit and commentator for Channel 4, so he is quite comfortable with the media. But in that moment, he waved Ted aside like, I don't want to talk right now. He was probably steaming, probably seeing what was happening when he was partners with Vettel, happening now to Oscar, and then wanting to give Lando more favours. Or at least that's what they think. They might need to clarify that or smooth things over McLaren. But right now, Oscar's probably getting a little bit antsy. And I bet you that Helmut Marco is sensing this and going, ooh, what's Oscar's number? Zach knew that both drivers could have won the race. He said so in this article with F1.com, telling us something we already knew, obviously. But would they really have been okay with Piastri winning Lando's home race? Because the data proved that he was faster. Would Lando have been okay with it? Him, in qualifying, have the grid position advantage and then losing it and ultimately ending up where he ended up? Look, it's my personal belief that the team saved itself from something even more controversial and something even more awkward between its drivers. Right now, they can learn a lot of things ready for the main battle in 2025 when it's definitely going to be Verstappen and Norris going for the world title. This is all practice. This is all learning. And if they can learn it now rather than next year, then fair enough. But still, there are a lot of opportunities to be had and Oscar really did get the short straw and he really just lost the opportunity to at least try and get third place and get a podium after him losing out due to a safety car last year and then Hamilton being just that little bit quicker. In another reality, I might be talking about how Oscar was denied because of team orders to allow Lando to win the British Grand Prix. Or in another, another reality, I could be talking about the controversy about Lando and Oscar colliding at the end of Stowe or going into turn one or something like that. That could have easily happened had both cars been competitive, Lando and Oscar were allowed to race one another, and Lando proving that he wants to try and bridge the gap between himself and Verstappen in the championship, and allowing his teammate to get ahead and deny points, and especially Verstappen closing in, and he would not want that to happen, especially if his team could have done something about it. It is indeed foam for thought, and a thought I really don't want to contemplate. Maybe this was for the best, and I'm still not happy. But what I do wish to contemplate more on, though, is the idea that Yuki Tsunoda might get a chance at the top seat after all, Christian Horner warming to the idea, given that his current role is Checo's stick to keep him motivated. Something I talk more about in this video here that you can go and watch next. It's, uh, it's looking better for Yuki than it was last week. Hmm.